Well, welcome everybody to Optometric Education Consultants uh, National Webinar Series, Sunday Night Edition. Our topic tonight is OCT interpretation, red, yellow, and blue disease, what is real disease, and what is physiologically normal. Our speaker is Dr. Greg Caldwell, a graduate of the Pennsylvania College of Optometry, where he also completed a one-year residency in primary care and ocular disease at the Institute in Philadelphia. He's a fellow of the American Academy of Optometry, a diplomate of the American Board of Optometry, and a member of the Optometric Glaucoma Society and member of the Optometric Wellness and Nutrition Society. He currently works in Duncansville, PA, as an ocular disease consultant. His primary focus is the diagnosis and management of anterior and posterior segment ocular disease. And he's been a participant in multiple FDA investigation and trials. He has integrated nutrition, prevention, and wellness into his patient care and practices full integrative optometry. He's a co-founder of Optometric Education Consultants and co-administrator of OCT Connect on Facebook. He has lectured extensively throughout the U.S. and over 13 countries internationally. In 2010, he served as the president of the, of the Pennsylvania Optometric Association and served on the AWA Board of Trustees from 2013 to 2016. He is president of the Blair Clearfield Association for the Blind. So with that, please give a nice, warm, virtual round of applause to our speaker, my partner, Dr. Greg Caldwell. And Greg, you can just take that away. Perfect, Joe. Thanks. And thanks for the nice introduction and some new people here tonight. And for those who have been here, you've heard that a couple of times now. Uh, let me just kind of go through the disclosures here. Um, you can see the big one here. The content was uh, independently prepared by me. You can see the list from Alcon to Santan uh, for Honoraria and Allergan to Inova for advisory boards. I don't really put that up there to impress anyone or try to make that list long. It's just more or less to if this guy from Duncansville, Pennsylvania is going to teach and teach colleagues, you know, it's just a nice another way of learning and seeing what's coming down the pipeline and just getting, I guess, underneath the hood of some of these uh, uh, some of these engines and companies. I don't have any direct financial proprietary interest in any of the companies or products that I talk about here tonight. I do sit as uh, involves P, uh, for involved the PA medical director uh, credentialing committee and special unit investigations. Uh, that's a managed Medicaid healthcare registries for AMD and diabetes. But right here is the biggest one. The content and the format of this course is presented without commercial bias and does not claim superiority of any commercial products. And as Joe mentioned, I just need to update this. We got a few other meetings on there, but half owner of Optometric Education Consultants. Another disclosure and everything's been mitigated. You know, the concepts discussed in this lecture can be applied really to any OCT that's out there. I do have the OptiView, which has now been bought out through by a couple of companies, but it's now under Vision, Visiononics. Um, and the content of, uh, of this course is presented without commercial bias. Just a lot of people ask me what I have. There it is right there. This is the OCT, OCTA. But again, the concepts will be, um, will be taught for all OCTs, unless there's something proprietary that's not on the other OCTs. And then I will point that out. Again, here's my practice. Uh, we own this building, electronic health records, nice optical we do have you know, six, seven exam lanes now. But the key is, you know, science is great. There's scientists, there's clinicians. Science is great, but if it doesn't have a clinical application, then, you know, it doesn't really mean much for us that are in clinics. So that's really my goal here is to try and take some of this science that's out there so that you can just be better the next day uh, in the office. So with that being said, we'll just do polling question number one here. Really, no history. It's you see this OCT. You've got the B scan image here. We got a ganglion cell complex here. We got a retinal thickness map here. We have ganglion cell numbers here. We have uh, uh, focal loss volume. This is very proprietary to the OptiView instrument. It stands for focal loss vol volume, global loss. In glaucoma, it becomes very focal. So this is red or, or yellow or red. We get concerned of glaucoma. This tells about the general health of, of a ganglion cell. So you see this red and yellow and you see these B scans. Again, no history. You know, it's saying, you know, green is good, yellow is caution, red is bad. Is this real disease or physiologically normal? 
So, and then let's see, what else did I put in here? Do you offer an OCT screening in your office was another follow-up question. We're going to have three of these to start off right off the bat. And then we're going to teach some concepts. And then we're going to come back and see uh, how you guys do. We'll do another like polling question. So you have this. This is kind of a screening in the office. This is uh, what we do. Uh, we don't have the OCTA down here. So this is just the patient getting a B scan, retina, and GCC. So is this patient you know, likely to have disease? All right, I'm going to end the poll, share the results, and we're not going to discuss it now. We have 30% saying real disease and 70%, and then offering a screening. Good. That number keeps climbing. Uh, we offer a, a screening package. We have a pretty high percentage of patients that do it. All right, I'll just launch the poll number two, but don't answer yet, people, because you don't see the slide yet. Now we do. Is this one real disease or physiologically normal? Again, you're just looking at it. Do you think that this one has disease on it? We're not counting uh, this little vitreomacular adhesion. We're going to discard that. So we're not going to call that disease. It's a red, yellow, blue, green course. So there's this yellow and this yellow and this blue. This yellow down here, is that causing you, oh, I guess I didn't launch it. Is that causing you to think that there's disease? And then which color here is most concerning? And that's a multiple choice question. Is it the red? Is it the yellow? Is it the blue? Which one's causing you? Is it all of them? So is this real disease or is this physiologically normal? Gonna have lots of polls tonight. I think we have like 13 polls to go through. I think maybe a few uh, people are having a couple couple poll issues like I am, Greg, but as long as people are coming in, that's great. Yep, they're rolling in. We have, that's a good number to be at. I'm gonna share the results. Let's see here. We're saying, all right, this one went up a little bit higher. We're saying 51%, 49%. And then pretty equal. Uh, someone, three people said the green is the concern. All right. Pretty equal on all the colors. All right. Number three. Let's see. I'm going to launch it. Make sure I get it launched this time. And this is number three here. Does this one have? considered disease. Yeah, we're now no history, just looking at the B scans, looking at the, the ganglion cell complex, lots of red, lots of yellow, blue over here. No. Yep, which is the most concerning. You can answer them all if you want. There's red, it's a multiple choice. Then we can have some discussion on these here. I'm not gonna get the answers. We're gonna teach some concepts here and then we'll revisit and see what if it, if it changed anything. Okay, people slowed down on this one. But I think we got the trend here, so we're gonna show it, share it. And we have 87% saying real and 13% saying physiologically. All right, we're gonna stop sharing. We're gonna get poll four ready. And uh, let's move into some of the lecture here. So, you know, green, red, yellow, blue disease, you know, physiologically normal, you know, OCT measurement structures here. 
these are just a few things that I've picked up over the years, you know, uh, when, when doing a OCT, you know, prefer to start evaluating uh, OCT with a bilateral scan. That's kind of where I like to start off. Instead of just looking at the right eye, looking at the left eye, I like as I had in these ones here, being able to kind of go back and forth and take a look at the numbers. So I don't really like diving in and just looking at the eye, right eye first, left eye first. So the first pearl or hint will be maybe to consider looking at them bilateral. And the reason being that I've learned over the years is that the really the symmetry between the eyes, unless one's a minus one and one's a minus eight, but if the refractive errors are similar, then the structures between the eyes have a lot of uh, inter and you know, intra, which one is it, Joe, between the two? I guess inter, inter, uh, uh, you know, symmetry. And when you have asymmetry, that starts to point us in the thoughts of direction of, uh, of disease. So I say it all the time when I talk to my patients, I say, look, this is what's concerning me here. Like you can have arthritis, it's in both elbows, but it could be a little bit worse in one elbow than the other. So, you know, disease in the body is, you know, in a sense you could say it is bilateral hip replacements. Oh yeah, I had this one done years ago. And, you know, then, then this one and probably cataract surgery, if it wasn't cataract refractive surgery, you know, usually cataract is worse in one eye, but then you have to deal with the anisometropia and so on and so forth. So they're usually done one or two weeks apart, but usually the one cataract is worse than the other eye uh, in most cases. So disease is usually bilateral, but asymmetric. And that's why I like looking at both at the same time so I can start seeing what these numbers look like. If the scans are symmetric in the numbers, you know, very rarely, and I'm sure there's a case out there of glaucoma where it started in both eyes and it happened to be equal, you know, progression in each eye. But a lot of the times glaucoma is asymmetric, one eye worse than the other. And that really can help us out on these ganglion cell complex, um, these nerve fiber layer type of measurements because the asymmetry is there. Um, so if it's very symmetric, now, obviously, you have to open up the scans and take a look, but if it's symmetric, it's most likely the kind of the hint and rule of thumb is it's probably physiologically normal. It's probably an anatomical variation. Maybe it's a large eye, smaller eye, shorter eye um, that's out there. So symmetry to me is good. Asymmetry, I need to start scratching my head. And how did we end up here? Another hint, and this is at least on the Opta view, when I go through these numbers and I review these all the time with the patients and a lot of times they're not open and I say, hey, look, this number is where I like to start. I'm going to you know, hope these numbers are between 85 and 100. And if they're not, and I say, I hope they're, eight, I hope they're symmetric. And if they're not, we'll need to talk about it and we'll go from there. So 85 to 100, at least for tonight, we'll use those numbers and on average, I see the ganglion cell complex being about 92 to 95. Now, that's not anything that's set. You kind of have the baseline. So what I would say is, you know, if you have a screening or a way to do bilateral, you hear what I say a lot. If you're going to get good at gonioscopy, I did it for two weeks straight on every patient when I was at an ODMD practice, and that got me good at gonioscopy. I'm getting good at, you know, uh, a cornea sensitivity since Oxervate came out because I like to now test cornea sensitivity. So how did I know what was normal and abnormal? I just started testing people and now I have a feel for what's normal. So if you want to see what's kind of normal with your instrument, start running it on everyone and just evaluating them. And these numbers now will start to fall into place uh, so that you can at least get a good baseline or where the patient patients are. So just let me walk you through what we're going to see a lot of scans tonight. We do a lot of wellness, so I look at these all day long. Where I like to start when I evaluate is I like to know the ganglion cell complex, and you'll see why here as we go through some of these some of these uh, scans tonight. That's why I like to know that this number is going should be between eighty five and hundred, and I'm looking for symmetry. When I was working with Optiview before they got bought out, me and a couple KOLs 
not that we couldn't do the math, but I wanted to see what the inter, I guess the inter and then the mm -hmm. intra, right? This is inter, right, Joe? Yes. Yep. And this is intra mm -hmm. within the eye, you know, 98, 98, 98, zero. Okay. There's zero difference. Now, a lot of people start asking, when do you start scratching your head? When it comes to a thin number like this small, not the whole retina, I like to start scratching my head if I start seeing as low as eight, probably <laughs> 10 is probably got some type of disease going on. So we go in between the eyes on the ganglion cell complex, because green is good, yellow is caution, red is bad, right? And then down here, focal loss, proprietary, just to the opti view. So I'll point those things out. And the global loss or the global loss volume, again, proprietary. This is for focal. If you see that red and green, it means that scratch your head in glaucoma. If you see this, it just tells you that the overall could be thin, but that could be due to a high myope. This, everything's normal here. This is what the way we want it to look like. And this is the way it should look like. But the normative database for these, I would have been a good polling question out there. The normal database for the, the biggest normative database that's out there for an OCT is 700, 700 people. And I forget which, which database that is, but they couldn't be high hyperopes. They couldn't be high myopes. They couldn't be patients with diabetes and so on and so forth. Uh, so they were truly a very normative database. And why I say that is, what about if the optic nerve is tilted? What about if it's a large optic nerve or a micro optic nerve or an obliquely inserted optic nerve or a 10 diopter myo? The other thing that you're going to see some of these tonight, we're not going to focus on, o on OCT angiography. But having these numbers, this is proprietary, again, to an OptiView unit because they have the angiolytics. This is showing the foveo avascular zone. You can see that when we do the OptiMaps, we show the big blood vessels, and I show the patient there's a whole capillary network. What I'd like to focus on is the foveo avascular zone, especially in someone with diabetes, because this is one of the thinnest areas right here where diabetes will affect because you're going from no vascular, the avascular zone, to a, and you can see, thin to 52%, to 54% being vasculature. So this is very susceptible to diabetic retinopathy. So this is why that, inch, that measurement is here. When this starts to become asymmetric, you know, about 10, then I like looking at the eye that's bigger for maybe diabetic retinopathy. But this whole scan was just to kind of show you what normal is in a sense very symmetric over here look at the look at the retina map 283 286 three th um in this para central area 311 314 259 259 exactly to microns and we're measuring these things in microns and again to remind us what a micron is if you take a millimeter and you cut it a thousand times that's a micron. If you cut that another thousand times, that's nano. That's nanotechnology with some of our drugs, but a millimeter. So I always say to my patient, look, slice of bologna, it's about a millimeter thick. If I'd say to the, uh, to the, to the delicatessen person, can you slice that another thousand times for me? That would be a micron. So when you see two and one differences, it would be, you know, two of those slices of bologna that I just chatted about. So this one is dead on at 259. We can see two microns because this is 317, 319, 280, 285. In the retina map, 10 is kind of like my low number. And that's kind of where I'll start scratching my head. And then 15, I'll start looking and making sure that there's no disease going yes. on. So this is a very, very symmetric and healthy looking type of, of, uh, of, of scan on an OCT here. All right, Joe, is there anything rolling in here before I move on? Oop, can no, I close the poll? No, okay, it's already yeah, not, closed. Not, not, that I, not that I see. Okay. And, you know, one, one, of the, one of the keys that I'm going to say uh, on something like this is you can have asymmetry, but that's when you start looking at other things. You look at the, uh, at the B scans. You look at the cross-section. Is there an epiretinal membrane that's giving you pseudo-thickness? You know, is there something else going on? That, that's when we start delving into more. Greg, you, you you remember the old GDX? Did you have that? 
Oh yeah, I had the GDX. Yep. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It and had the number. Yeah, it was great. Yeah, it, it was great. The N the NFI trying to uh, boil everything down to one single number, and that's kind of where things went a went afoul and went astray. We really can't do that. We have to look at everything here. Greg, for, for the OCT, what's a good normal range? You said 250, but what's plus or minus? Yeah, that's going to be a little bit different on everyone that's out there. I mean, the key, again, that's a great question that's out there. What is that, Maryland? The great question is that, again, don't try and put a normal number there. You know, it's kind of like saying, you know, um, you know, this patient came in and they were 280 pounds um, and all oh, they must have been fat, but they happened to be, you know, I'm a Steeler fan. So James Harrison uh, for the Pittsburgh Steelers, who had like two ounces of fat and was ripped. So that's the key that we have to be careful with, with these numbers. The key to the concept that you want to kind of look at them. And we'll see as we go through here that you'll see how that plays. But that's a great question. I'll try and point that out. Uh, what's the difference? Yeah, the I, th I think this image. is a great question. Yeah, this is a great question. I think a lot of people have this question. What's the difference between the top and bottom images for ODOS? So what are they asking, Joe? Help me out. Like th this one? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. So that is a great question. I see what you're saying here, David. So thank you. You see this cut right here or this arrow right here? That means it's this cut like right through here. It's right through the this is the fovea, right? There's no ganglion cells. The ganglion cells are here and they're here. They're not in the foveal pit. So this cut right here is going through right here. And you can see that this is going down. So this is superior going down to the fovea, going right through here, and then down inferior. So this is superior. This is through the fovea. This is inferior because this arrow is pointing down. This one here, this is temporal going to the foveal pit over to nasal. You can always tell that this is the nasal side because you can see how thick the nerve fiber layer is here compared to over here because right over here where the left eye is, that's where the optic nerve is. Yeah, great question. Uh, so uh, this is the horizontal and this is the vertical cut. You know, I'm, I'm glad somebody asked that question because it's one of those things that people look at and maybe make assumptions, but I'm, I'm glad you, you had the opportunity to explain that. That's very good. Yeah. Thanks, David. And thanks, Joe, for pointing that out now. Now, let me show you something here, guys. Look, you see how we cut through here? Boom, 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 boom. But if we cut through here, look, look at this cut here. Where are the blood vessels? Where are the major blood vessels? Where are the major blood vessels here? Look. Boom, boom, not one here, boom, boom, boom. So that's why when you go through this cut, I'll point them out here. You see, there's a blood vessel, shadow. Here's a blood vessel, 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 blood vessel, blood vessel, the vertical cut, because we're cutting this way. If you cut through here and you're not hitting any blood vessels, that's why you don't see those shadows. So that's another point. Like right here, you see a couple. So in here somewhere, there's a, you know, on this, I guess, if you want to say temporal side, as you cut through here, we cut through some blood vessels, maybe that one right there. You can see boom, boom, but there's not any here. But look how many you have when you go vertical. Boom, 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 boom. So great question. Greg, I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna pose a question for the audience because I think probably some people may may wonder this. How do you differentiate that from let's say an exudate in a diabetic eye? Yeah, uh, that is a great question. Um, this kind of Dr. Lombardi was correct. Everything's about anatomy. That was our uh, PCO. She kept saying, learn this anatomy. Um, so that's pretty superficial. Uh, there's a loose space between the inner retina and outer retina. That's why you see like lamellar holes uh, in this space right through here. This is the capillaries right here that we're seeing in the retina. They're in this inner retina. So when they leak, they usually leak down into this space. So exudate for diabetic retinopathy is usually right through here. And I'm not sure if we'll have any cases in this lecture um, because it's more focused on the green disease, but we might have something a little bit later about regarding diabetes. I focused on glaucoma since a lot of us like glaucoma, but it'd be more mm -hmm. down here between the inner and outer retina. And Greg, would it be also safe to say they'd be a lot more reflect reflectile with more uh, more shadowing underneath? Yep, they they're definitely a little bit 
more most of the time more dense and they're going to hyper reflect and then there's going to be a nice shadow below it yep and the same thing with a hemorrhage um you can't really tell the difference between a hemorrhage and an exudate um you kind of have to look uh at that with your 90 and 78 good any questions out there time to move on no no we're time we're good okay all right so let's do a case here this is a 46 year old woman with red and yellow disease, you're gonna see why I say that. A low myo, thyroid dysfunction, cholesterol, she's on medications for those and her pressures are 15 at 8.30 in the morning. So low myo, a little bit of thyroid, cholesterol, pressures are 15. Here are, are the, here's this patient, okay? So I'm gonna show them side by side. This is why I don't like looking at them first individually. When I come down, I always like to look at the GCC. I see 110, but now I see all this redness. And then I come over here. Now I'm gonna put these up together. This is a little bit easier to evaluate. Now, remember, that's why you kind of have to threshold or kind of know the numbers in your head. And I like starting with ganglion cell complex. 110, 110, 111, 109, 110, 111. Flagging it as green, very symmetric inter between the eyes, interocularly, intra only one and two. Now I said 85 to 100. That's just kind of a base that I like to have in my head. And I like that because I go, wow, if it's 90 as average and this patient has 110, that's 20 microns. That's a lot of microns, but that's bonus for the patient. That's why they don't have glaucoma. The general health looks good. But when you come over to the retina map, everything's red. This scale here, we didn't talk about it. This scale here is the retina map. And the retina map says green is in the middle. Yellow and red would mean thicker than average. And blue means thinner than average. Well, geez, oh man, look at all this redness. Oh, what do they have? Do they have that every retinal membrane? Do they have just global retinal edema? Well, that's why the B scans are here. There's the optic nerve starting nasally and cutting across here. You can see that I really don't see any disease. And we can open this up, but we're just looking at the B scans here right now. Sometimes you do have to open up and poke around and look around, but I don't see anything gross going on here. Nothing's gross is going on here. It's saying it's abnormally thick, but that's not unusual because look how thick this GCC is. You know, 90 is on average, we're 20 microns thick. And I can tell you right now, two and five microns can make a difference when you're looking at these things. This could be 330 and this could be 325 and one is green and one is, you know, blue or red. But if we look 330, 329, 59, 64, 293, 294, 235, two microns, and then three microns. If I just go down through here, they're all within two or three microns. Now, remember, you have to go inside to inside on this one. You can go up and down. You can go superior to inferior, but you have to go nasal. So 335, look at that, 335, 357, 359, two microns outside, 42 to 36, 322 to 323. They're all within just a handful. This red disease, this yellow disease on this 47-year-old myo needs no further workup. It's too symmetric. I don't know of any disease out there that I would be concerned about with this patient. All right. Now, what you want to do is look for things like this. When it is red, right, here's a little hot spot. You can see the retinal edema in this patient. This is what Joe was alluding to is like this patient here. You would look to see if there's an epiretinal membrane or some type of fluid causing this to be thick. But when we go and look at this patient, they look pretty clean, right? So I don't see any disease that would be causing it. And it's just, in my opinion, too symmetric. Let's do another case here. Uh, we have a 63-year-old woman with red, yellow, blue, and green disease. Look at it, hardly any prescription, basically presbyopic, IOPs are good. And here is her 2015 scan. 
And when you go and you look at the ganglion cell, this is now kind of the opposite of what I saw with this other patient. The other patient was 2, 110, 110, 110, 109, 108, 110. This one here is 83, which is now green. Now we're 80, 81, two microns. Now we're yellow. Now we're 81, 81, 85, green, 82. And it's two, zero, and three. That's too much symmetry between the eyes. And then we jump down to it's four microns and one micron. Again, in the ganglion cell, I don't scratch my head until it's about eight. It's about my low 10. Yeah, I better dig around and see what's going on. But I like this here. It says, hey, doc, it's not really glaucomatous. It's this, you know, it's just kind of a general loss. Now, we can come up here and we can take a look at what's happening with the retina. Remember, yellow, green is in the middle. That means it's average retinal thickness. Yellow and red would mean thicker than average. Blue means thinner than average. 254, 254. Let's go to this C right here. This is pretty crazy. 265 is blue. 265 is green. They both say 265. There's a lot more parameters. There's a lot more than just the number that goes into calling this blue or green or yellow or red. 265 on this one turns out to be blue. Over here, it's green. You come down here, 248. Two microns go from green down to 246 is blue. And then we can go, remember, go outside. You can go outside 284 to 288 and 255 to 256. There's a ton of symmetry on here. If I fold this in half, right where I just kind of drew, took that arrow and unfolded it, it almost looks like an ink blot. Look, this yellow to that yellow. I mean, there's a little bit of red there. There's no red over here. Got a little bit of yellow or red here, a little yellow here. There's just too much symmetry. So I just said to her, let's, you know, I don't really need to do any workup, nothing going on here. And when we saw her back in 2016, 81, 81, 81, 81, 82, 81, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, green, general loss. I mean, you fold this in half, yellow, red, yellow, red, yellow, red, you, you know, just some yellow, a little bit of red, the backward C, the frontward C, and the numbers are still very symmetric. She's just outside the normative database. And I think OptiView's normative database is like four or 500 people right? That are normal, not high myopes, not, not, uh, not hyperopes, nothing tilted, so on and so forth. That's out there. So this is just too symmetric to be in a sense disease. Here's a 58 year old yellow disease plus low hyperopic IOP 2020 IOPs, you know, 13 to 15. And I have here pay attention probably as a little reminder for me. But again, looking at these individual can start to make you look at, oh, geez, what's going on? And then in a, in a follow-up lecture in a few weeks, I'm going to start showing how this vitreous can, can sometimes wreak havoc. But you can see these are blood vessels, blood vessels. But let's go down here, 82, 81, 81. Focal looks good. The global looks, you know, hey, just a little bit thin than average. And you can come over here, 81, 81. Let's see if I have them together. Yeah. Now, when you put them together, look at this red, red, island, island, wrap around, wrap around, this little thing, this little thing. Look how it almost looks like an ink blot if you would just fold it in half. Lots of symmetry. 82, 81, 82, 81, 82, 81. Focal loss. It's just saying, hey, it's just generally thin ganglion cell. Again, too symmetric, right? To, this patient's is 81, the other one was 110, and that's why I love starting to look at the ganglion cell before moving over to the retina map. 270, 279, okay, nine microns different, then we drop down to four, then we drop down to one, seven, and then one. And again, remember, go outside to outside. So this one here doesn't have any disease. Now, I'm gonna say maybe no ocular disease, right? because there's some thoughts out there. Are we picking up on neurogenic diseases? Could this be early signs of Parkinson? Could this be early signs of dementia? 
things that are out there. So I'm going to say ocular disease like glaucoma, like epiretinal membranes, diabetic retinopathy, vitreomacular traction. But again, I'm going to go back and say, well, if it's dementia, maybe it's a risk factor, but it's not the dementia-ish causing it because, again, it, to me, it's too symmetric. That's out there. All right. So 40, a 40-year-old 40 woman with red disease, blue, green. I think you guys are getting it. Look at this, a little higher myo. 15 and 16. Let's take a look. Let's just put them up. Maybe do I have them both together? Yeah, I guess they're there. So again, this is March 16 of 2015. We can see here 80, 78, 82. Over here, 80 to 80, 78 to 78, 81 to 82. The only thing here is one micron difference. Mm -hmm. Not glaucomatous, general loss, higher myope. Lots of being flagged here, right? Lots of red, lots of yellow, lots of concern in that ganglion cell, lots of concern in the ganglion cell layer. But it's, again, too symmetric. We come over here, 257 in the retina, right eye, 257, 285. Jeez, 285, dead on both for there. 250, 252, 291, 294, 274. I'm sorry, 247 and 247. Look at all that symmetry that is just too much symmetry for it to be. This is two years later. They came back probably for their routine exam. And here they are side by side. Did anything change in two years? 22 months apart, almost two years. 80 to 80, 80 to 79, 77 to 77, 78 to 78. 82 to 81, 83, we went up one, now we're yellow, and now we're 80 to 81. Again, focal loss is good, just general loss. Nothing's really changed in two years. So, you know, we have to be careful with these, with these databases that are out there with this yellow, red, and blue. That's why I like looking at them side by side, like here, starting to evaluate, are there asymmetries? And if there are, maybe that is disease. All right, let's see, getting sloppy with the mouse again. All right, here we go. 29 year old man with a uh, man with myopia, right? You would think that this would be thinner, but look at the symmetry again, myopia, 100, 98, 102, 98, 99 at the thicker edge right? Only four microns, not glaucoma, general health looks good. And then when you come down through, you can see 290, 296, 336, 337. And then, oh, it's flagging it as red. Well, let's go look at the B scans. As Joe mentioned earlier, I don't see any diabetic macular edema, no epiretinal membranes, just happens to be thicker than average within that macula. Maybe the ganglion cells are a little bit closer to the to the to the fovi uh, to the foveola as opposed to sometimes right we see when when we have this foveal pit i'm not sure how far back i have to go but sometimes when we look at these foveal pits right like this one here why is it flagging it red well that foveal pit's a little bit wider and so now they're saying look how red this is but it's just a larger foveal pit uh, and it's just outside what they're considering there shouldn't be any. It's just a larger area as opposed to maybe this one here is a little bit smaller. And now we're capturing some of that thickness. It's not as deep and now it's red. So I don't really see any macular edema or epiretinal membranes. No workup needed for this patient. 29-year-old. All right. That was kind of getting us through what's physiologically normal. Nothing tricky here. This is all disease. And I have someone here for glaucoma analysis, the GCC affected by macular disease, epiretinal membrane, diabetes, or AMD. That came in to me. So hopefully that will, that was a direct message. So um, we'll see what happens as we go through here for glaucoma. Now, um, we got to remember, you know, red disease, yellow disease, blue disease, this is all real disease. Remember, glaucoma is a disease of the optic nerve. So what do I have here? Where does glaucoma damage in the neuroretinal rim of the optic nerve? So where does that disease occur on the neuroretinal rim? Where does, it's a glaucoma is a disease of the optic nerve. 
where does it occur? Is it superior? Is it inferior? Is it nasal? Is it temporal? Where does glaucoma occur? Use the chat box. I don't have this as a polling question. So let's see what we get here. Nothing's rolling in yet. Where does glaucoma occur on the neuroretinal rim? Is it superior, inferior, nasal, temporal, superior nasal, inferior nasal? Where does it occur? I hear inferior nasal, inferior temporal, inferior, inferior. Keep them rolling in and we'll just kind of take our time here. Superior temporal, inferior temporal, inferior nasal, superior, inferior. This is part of that interactive, synchronous, virtual requirement. So thanks for participating. While everyone is rolling in with their answer, I see a lot of superiors and inferiors, and I've seen a couple roll in. It, we're going to point out that it's usually superior temporal or inferior temporal. This is a patient that has glaucoma. I didn't blow these up real big. I just kind of wanted to make the point, but there's a little bit of a, of a notch here. A lot of people think that it's inferior always first, but it could be superior first. So it doesn't matter, superior, inferior. Superior and inferior are good answers, and I would go superior temporal and inferior temporal too. So superior temporal, inferior temporal uh, would, be the, uh, would be the answers I would go for. And then as we go through and look at this, you can see that there's a little dropout right here. And Joe, you'll like this because I know you're big on nerve, you know, the 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 red free and, and looking yeah. at that nerve fiber layer, you could see that little defect right there. Indeed you can. As look how wide this one is. You can see the defect right there. Put that in for you, Joe. Thank you, Greg. So again, you can see it right here. You can see. So superior, what I wanted to get out of this is superior temporal, inferior temporal is kind of the glaucoma prone zones. So that's if the disc is not tilted, obliquely inserted. That's if you have a disc that's plugged into the, into the eye, the back of the eye, if you want to say the correct way in air quotes there, where you know, the superior is superior and inferior. It's not obliquely or tilted uh, optic nerve head. So what I was trying to show with this slide here is that when you're looking at these scans, remember the nerve fiber layer is a ring that goes around and we're going to concentrate on that superior temporal, inferior temporal or superior or inferior. So I would start with superior or inferior temporal, then go superior, inferior. And in this case, we're trying to show that there's damage, but you should see how that ganglion cell kind of should match in some cases. And then people will ask, is it the ganglion cell first or the nerve fiber layer first? And my answer is yes. It can sometimes show up in the ganglion cell as being flagged and the nerve fiber layer is okay, or sometimes the nerve fiber layer is 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 damaged and the ganglion cell is okay and i'm just trying to say those backwards this one's damaged this one isn't or this one's damaged and this one isn't all right i was thinking visual field nasal step gotcha all right i was too yep all right so here we go with we're going to start looking at some of these so remember ganglion cell nerve fiber layer and if you remember just some real quick anatomy Remember, if we go back and we look at the, you know, these nerve fiber layer, wherever it is, the, the ganglion cell is here, right? The ganglion cell is here. And then we go up with an axon. That axon now leaves as the nerve fiber layer. The nerve fiber layer then makes that 90 degree bend and forms the neuroretinal rim of the optic nerve. It's an axon in the optic nerve, goes through the lamina cribosa, then is in the orbit where it now becomes myelinated. Remember, now it's myelinated, now goes back to the lateral geniculate body and synapses. That's that axon that's coming out of that ganglion cell. So just remember how long that axon is. And it's that axon right here that I was just talking about. It's in the ganglion cell. It just I just showed you where it comes out. Now it's in the nerve fiber layer. 
Then it makes that 90 degree bend, goes, makes it's part of the neuroretinal rim, goes through the lamina carbosa, through the optic nerve, through the frame, and, and then synapses at the lateral geniculate body. That's the axon that we need to try and keep alive in glaucoma. So the ganglion cell complex is the nerve fiber layer, the ganglion cell layer itself, and the inner plexiform layer as compared to the rest of the retina. And sometimes I like opening these up and taking a look at them to see if the instrument is what, what we say segmented or found the right part to make sure that there's, if it looks a little funny, sometimes you know, like Joe mentioned, there might, it might be an exudate. Maybe it's hitting the exudate and bouncing back and not segmenting the right way. Sometimes I just like to see, is there glaucoma damage? Here is the side. I opened this patient up that has glaucoma. You can see that there is nice, healthy ganglion cell, nerve fiber layer. You can see where the ganglion cells were damaged, and then it just thinned this whole area out. This one here, I'm not really... I just wanted to see if it would show up in the segmentation. They had a very uh, uh, advanced glaucoma on one side than the other, superior versus inferior. And so I wanted to see if it would show up, and it did. So and a lot of times I just want to check to see if the segmentation is okay. All right, so let's look at what is normal. Okay, I'm just going to go through a scan here, and then we're going to show a whole bunch of scans of abnormal kind of get on this to kind of get on the same page here. So remember, this is the nerve fiber layer ring. Now remember, this ring is set to be a certain size when measured uh, with the OCT. But what happens if you have a macro disc? That, di that disc is a lot larger. So that distance between the edge of the optic nerve and where that ring is, is going to be smaller. What happens if it's a micro disc, right? The optic nerve is about one and a half millimeters, one 1,500 microns. What happens if it's 1,000? What happens if it's 2,000? Those 500 microns are going to make a difference on where those fibers come through and where this is measuring. So that's why sometimes we can get some, some yellow or red disease just because the disc is bigger or smaller. So we're looking at this rim, superior temporal, inferior temporal. Again, superior temporal, inferior temporal, a good, well, you hear T-snit, temporal, superior, nasal, inferior, temporal, going up, down, up, down. G Joe mentioned about the, the GDX. We learned that in the GDX days because we didn't have ganglion cell. We we're looking at the T-snits, making sure that they're healthy. We can come down here, look at this patient. I always start with the GCC. I want to know what's going on. 102, 102, 100, 101, 104. Again, a little thicker than average, little bonus, right? 100, one mic or zero, one and zero microns, four and three difference intraocularly, focal loss volume, global loss volume. This is just showing you normal. All right, I think I have a polling question here coming up. Oh, I guess not. All right, let's see. All right, so let's look at this one here. This one here is a glaucoma patient. Let's jump down. 92, 87, 93, 78. See the 15 microns inferior, right? Or superior, I'm sorry, superior. says superior right there, superior 78. You can see it's thinner here, not over here. These are all glaucoma patients, nothing tricky here. And you can see inferior is 92 and 96. This disease is superior. The focal loss volumes being flagged. Hey, doc, be cautious here. This is outside. This one looks good. Nothing focal happening over here. Look at the GCC being thin. The nerve fiber layer, superior temporal, is crashed down compared to superior temporal here. And you can see it over here when they put them combined. But let's go up and take a look. See the, 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 the glaucoma prone zone, as Joe and I hear us say so many times at a lecture, 74 and 76. 74 compared to 110. Look at the asymmetry. 76 compared to 81, right? So this area right here in this superior zone is really, really concerning where the disease is. Known glaucoma patient in the left eye, nothing tricky here. Here's another glaucoma patient worse than the left eye. Look at the T-snit here. Look how flat it is. We go up here. You can hardly see. Let's go back and look at the normal one. This looks nice and robust. This looks nice and robust. 
We go here, we could see the drop down compared to here. Then we go here, where's all the nerve fiber layer? Bad here at eight, at 65, bad here at 64, even so inferior temporally, inferior, superior temporally, affecting superior and inferior. And you can see that's the nerve fiber layer. Over here, it's not as bad, but it's still superior temporal, not as bad, inferior temporal. And so let's go look at the GCC. 82 is green, 78 is green, 85 is green. There's disease here, but it's still saying it's within the normative database of being normal, even though you can see the disease, but it's asymmetric. The total is 12. The disease is definitely worse here inferiorly, and it's flagging it. You have some disease here. That's why you don't get the big asymmetry because this is coming down kind of equal to this other side, only flagging it as five. But this 18 over here is what you can really see is causing the disease. And it's saying, hey, doc, looks like there's glaucoma in this left eye. And over here, this is concerning, right? It's saying, eh, don't worry about it. It doesn't look glaucomatous. And that's why you have to kind of know the condition and know the instrument. All right, let's go a little bit quicker here because I have a bunch of them. Just let's go here. Uh, known glaucoma patient. Looks like it's a little bit worse in the right eye compared to the left eye by looking at the yellows and greens. Six different, eight different. Remember I said I start scratching my head at eight, but look, they're both in green. But then you jump down here, inferior, there's a four. So that's why you got to be careful with the colors. And that's why you kind of have to use some of these rules. Here it says focal loss volume is concerning. It's not a general loss. Glaucoma likes to create those arcuate defects, and that's why it creates an arcuate defect on a, on a visual field. And you can see here, these are pretty symmetric. These are starting to become a little bit asymmetric. Here's the inferior temporal. So right here, you can see how this has been pushed down. You can see where the disease is affecting here as opposed to it's affected here because it was probably high, but it's affecting more in the left and the right eye than the left eye. And you can see it reflecting in the numbers. So using some of those uh, rules out there. Again, glaucoma is usually asymmetric. Here's the difference between the eyes. Here's an 11. Superior is not too bad, but look, inferior 18 in the ganglion cell. Look at this ganglion cell complex to this ganglion cell complex. And then we come up here and we start looking inferior. Look at the inferior temporal and the inferior temporal right and left eyes. Joe, you got any comments? Because I know this is kind of right down your sweet spot. I can go back. I can go forward. Any comments? If you, if you, could, if you could go back one, I'm going to try to kind of guide. Uh, we're going to stick with the nerve fiber layer on the, uh, on the scan. If you look at the inferior average, okay, of the, of the right eye, it is 74 and it is yellow. And if you're looking at that alone, you think, okay, that couldn't, you know, that's sort of borderline. Maybe if I did it again, it'll, it'll be in green or still stay yellow. But if we go back to the image over there, inferior temporal, we have a, a, an area that is highly statistically significant. Remember that is inferior temporal. We got to consider, we got to average everything together. When you average those two quadrants together, from there and there, it gives you a yellow. And that's the important thing is when, we, when we're when we averaging areas together, there's a lot of anatomic territory being averaged in there. And when that happens, something that may be thicker may drag it up and fall within the normative data range. And I think that's a, a very important. Now, if we actually look at the, at the left eye, there's an area that is borderline statistically significant at 103, but if we look at what it says on an average, you know, that inferior nasal brings it up. And you think that you're looking at something that is perfectly fine. That's why we have to kind of really look at everything in, in here. Oh, man. All right, there we go. I was admitting someone and I clicked forward. So there's where <laughs> you were making your points. And there's this mm -hmm. to this. Good point. I like it. Anything and, else? Yeah, yeah. It, 
I'm going to urge, as you are, Greg, to everybody, look at as much information as you can. Get away from that GDX mindset of looking for one thing that tells you yes or no. Would anybody, I mean, any, would anybody out there want to, you know, have have a brain scan done and have the radiologist look at one cut? Well, no, they have to go through the entire brain to see what's going on. Think of yourself as ophthalmic radiologist going through all these layers and putting it all together. Good points. Good points. I'm going to go back. So when you're looking at an OCT, glaucoma assessment, which is going to be typically more accurate? Is it going to be the neurofiber layer or is it going to be the ganglion cell? Or maybe I should have put a third option like, hey, doc, they're both going to be going to be accurate. So which one is going to be more accurate? Is it going to be, the, you know, typically more accurate? Is it going to be the ganglion cell measurement or the nerve fiber layer? All right. No, no, no option here of, hmm. I'm not sure, and that's why I'm here. This is one you have to make a decision on. So, all right, looks like we got a pretty good amount. I'm going to hit share results, and we've got pretty close to 50 50, but uh, so we'll say 60 40. We'll say people say the ganglion cell complex is it. So, I'm going to stop sharing to help people out and going to get ready for poll number five. And my answer or the way I've seen over the years is that, and this is why I have this one up here, is the ganglion cell should be a little bit more accurate. When you see these progression analysis on most visual, most uh, OCTs have them, they usually have these gray bars and these gray bars are what they call the confidence interval in a sense it's saying that this blue line could be anywhere between here and then the trend line could be anywhere within this gray box uh, as it goes through here. And you can see how it's trending by connecting the dots, but this is the confidence interval. This confidence interval is really good. This confidence interval is really good. Now, what I don't, what makes me a concern is one of these scans is probably not accurate or doesn't have a high signal strength because look how this confidence interval is. And the reason why I would say that the ganglion cell should have the higher uh, accuracy is because when you look at the test and you're measuring the ganglion cell layer, you're looking at it with your macula. Look at the red light, look at the green light, whatever the color of the light is, look at the light you're looking at it with your macula to get nerve fiber layer you kind of have to look at the light it moved over nasally you're rotating the eye and they have to fixate and sometimes their eye is moving a little bit they have to rotate nasally to get the nerve fiber layer to get that circle over the optic nerve to be able to get it so typically what i see in my confidence intervals is that the ganglion cell is a little bit tighter than the nerve fiber layer this makes me a concern here uh, that there might be a bad scan, but I can now go back and see that the nerve fiber layer. So when you're making these decisions on whether the glaucoma is stable, and Joe, here's your kind of your kind of washer. You always say your window wiper or your nauti nautilus shell. No, kind I, of I, I, I call that the nautilus shell. So someone has, in a sense, said that it looks like they took a wiper and kind of like a wind, like a window wiper. But this is the Nautilus shell approach. Um, oh man! So now this one looks pretty, pretty stable, right? We're looking here. You know, there's, you know, there's some variation. We're measuring in things and thousands of a of a of a of a, of, of, um, of a millimeter. This one here is going straight across. This one has a little downhill trend. This one's going straight across. So this ganglion cell and this nerve fiber layer, this little downhill trend and this little stability, I'm going to call this pretty stable over all these years. So that's just kind of wanted to point out just some of the things that are found on a progression analysis and point out that 
I typically see the ganglion cell being a little bit more accurate, like these ones here that I put in here. See how tight this confidence interval is compared to this little bit of, say, sloppiness to the nerve fiber layer. The patients, unless they have macular degeneration, are seeing pretty, pretty, you know, using that macula, using the macula, and you see a nice little small confidence interval here. And it's telling you the rates of progression. You know, this one here is going uphill, right? This one's saying, hey, the patient is gaining 0 0.53 microns per year. Over here, it's saying, well, the ganglion cell complex per year is 0 0.05. Joe, do you have any exact or any number you like to say rate of change? I've heard like, you know, 0 0.1, you know, 0 0.15 is normal over the years. Do you have anything normal in here that uh, I'll throw that out? I, I think that if you start looking at two or three microns per year, you have to be concerned. I mean, there there are there will be some physiologic variation. It, it, it's hard to say in the real world when you have different technicians who are are scanning your patients and you know you're trying to compare this information to uh trained observers in control clinical studies at the university level you don't really have quite the same reproducibility but you know once i start seeing maybe two microns per year if i i, mean, I can sit i gotta consider that so, right. you know, someone just asked the question, doesn't, yeah. doesn't the lack of precise image registry of this device make the rate of change a bit more difficult to assess? And I'm going to say, I guess, yes. Um, there's all these instruments struggle with getting, you know, in a sense, image registries. And, you know, I've chatted with a lot of people that lecture in here. And when you think you're kind of looking at the same cut on a, uh, on a uh, on a scan and even though you found certain things that they're not always seem to be lined up and i can tell you that's where the instruments are going they're getting better and better with getting uh, registries for these so uh yeah i mean this is in, in my instruments a little bit older i'm sure there's some improvement out there uh, with uh, image regist registries but i know that there's still issues with image registry that is out there so yeah that's a great uh, it's a great comment um, a lot of people still use older instruments. So that's why I kind of practice and give tips on, you know, on, on instruments that are usually in the market that's out there. All right. Is the GCC affected by macular disease, epiretinal membrane dive? The answer is yes. I got that one to myself, Joe. Uh, is GCC affected by macular disease? Yes. We're going to show that as we come up through here um, when we see that. What's the average margin of error within the machine measurements itself? Um, that's a good question. I know that they always say plus or minus a few microns. Um, do you know that answer, Joe, by chance? I don't for this device. Do you know what they are for any of them? I don't know. Uh, you know, they're going to always say like plus or minus if we go back to a to a screening there it's marked on there it will say plus or minus how many microns uh that that are out there so um yeah it's it's one or two microns that the accuracy of these instruments you know you can measure them one time and it could be 80 measure it the next time it's 82 measure it the next time it's 78 so you know you could say plus or minus two microns uh that's out there it's pretty tight with the spectral domain um, that's out there, but it's still you're measuring things in microns. So I would say two microns just kind of as a clinician, maybe there's if someone out there that's a OCT technician or OCT that's listening, I'll put it in the chat box, but I would say plus or minus two microns. You know, so like just showing here, we're doing progression analysis. See how wide these confidence intervals are? Um, you know, here's some data that's missing. You know, you're trying to make the decision on is the glaucoma controlled. That's why we don't always just use OCT. There's some data missing here, but the but the uh, GCC is um, is you know is a more <laughs> is more useful than say the nerve fiber layer over here. Where you can see it's a little bit tighter. You can see the range is 1.4 microns per year. Like Joe mentioned, when you start getting up around two. You know, you might want to can start scratching your head. Uh, is the uh, is the glaucoma 
uh, uh, controlled. You can see it's a lot more advanced in the right eye than the left eye here. Glaucoma suspect, strong family history. Uh, patient is running maybe some higher pressures. You can see now you know, that the gas tank is at 100 microns. Here it's about 90. That's typically what I see is there, when we looked at nerve fiber layer. Usually they're around 100. They're usually about 90 in the ganglion cell. And it's just the gas tank. We're just watching for it to go down. This patient's running a little bit higher pressure and nothing's happening. This one's going uphill. They're not growing ganglion cell. It just the that average that we talked about. Um, and there is, yes, what do we expect with age? I've heard about a zero, like 0 0.1, 0 0.2 microns per year that you can expect to lose with age. So it's not much, you know, 0 0.1 micron. Uh, however long it takes to get to, you know, one micron. But there is a little bit of atrophy that can occur with aging. All right. And yeah, we saw enough of these. All right, strong family history. What part of the eye is most likely due to change because of aging? What part of the eye is most likely to change due to aging? Is it the cornea? Is it the retina? Is it the vitreous? Is it the optic nerve? Is it the cornea, the retina? Which one is most likely to have change due to aging? Everything's looking pretty good in the chat. People are rolling in nicely. So for the sake of time, I'm going to end the poll. I think people are on it. I'll share the results. I think all of us think probably have a reason that, you know, say the cornea would change or maybe the retina, like macular degeneration. But I think the one that we always expect, you know, is the vitreous, right? The vitreous is going to shrink. It's going to create floaters. It's going to, you know, the vitreous is, in my opinion, just needed to come through the birth canal. Maybe there's some other great reason it's out there, but... All it does after that is create problems between flashes and floaters and PVDs and retinal holes and epiretinal membranes that's out there. I'm going to be doing a kind of a part two to this probably in February, and I'm going to really show you where the vitreous can create and wreak havoc on an OCT, um, and that's probably going to be in October. I'm going to stop sharing that so in case it's on people's screens, and I'm going to get ready for poll number six if we get to it. And so my whole point is about this is the vitreous is the one that can really, you know, change in the eye. Um, let's see here. What did I do here? All right. Um, which is probably the more abnormal eye here? I'm going to launch the poll. Is it the, and there's a reason why I have things hidden up here, but which one? I mean, we got some yellow disease here. You got some red disease here. We got red disease here, blue disease here. It's not a fair question, but it's fun to do when we're doing interactive and distance learning. You know, which eye is the eye here? You know, if you're, this is more of a gamble. There's really nothing clinical maybe going on here. You're breaking some of the rules. There's 81, 81, 81. There's uh, 93, 97, 90. We've got yellow, we've got green, we've got red. Which one do you think is the diseased eye here? Now, Greg, while the, while the answers are coming in, there's something I want to look at, uh, a study I wanted to look up that I had recalled. And it's in a very reputable journal, IOBS, uh, in terms of aging change. And it's actually, it depends on what quadrant you look at. So, you know, inferior changes the most, nasal changes the least. So there's no real one right answer. If we look at overall average, uh, the rate of change in this study in, in IOVS was about 0.65 microns per year. That was an aging change. But I do want to caution you, or you know, it was basically healthy younger people. I think that the, uh, the average age was around 39 years old. And Joe, I know you're very well read and you're an excellent writer. And if you can remember to send that to me, that would be great. Surely. All right. All right. We have 70% saying the right eye. We have 30% saying the left eye. 
All right, it's written there. I'm going to stop it to get it out of your way. And then I'm going to get polling question number seven ready. So a lot of people said the right eye. Let's see if I have this animated properly, and I don't. And let's see here. Let's see if I, let me just jump out. Let me see if I have to do this. Get to my poll. Let's see, yeah, there it is. I didn't animate. I'm going to delete it now. I'm going to share this again. All right, and now we're going to share. Forgot to animate it, got excited. All right, here it is right here. We thought 70% thought this one was. But when we come up here and take a look, look here. Look at this green, but look what we have going on right here. All right. And that's why, you know, it's just, and I know it was unfair. And that's why I got to look now all this. Now, if you look here, look at the, look at the symmetry between the eye within the eye seven, this is 97. This is 90. You know, there's a lot of green going on here. This is red. This is thicker than average. Here's 290. Here's 265. There's that 319. And look right here. Now that's why it's thicker. So, yeah, it's it's just, you know, it was a tough question. So this was a 30-year-old woman that came in. I needed my contact lenses updated. And that's what she had right there. She had that happening. The good news is, and I was a little concerned with her because she's young, that vitreous is stuck down. Why is she getting a vitreomacular traction at such a young age? You can see the, a lot of the traction that's going on. This vitreous is dynamic. Um, that's out there. But the good news is she did. Whew, we were lucky it released. You know, I followed her back because she was at risk to me for some type of lamellar hole, macular hole, whatever traction that can happen that's out there. You can see this is what she looked like before. And this is what she looked like after. So she released uh, in just a few like months. So in the another lecture, what we'll do is we'll do the uh, we'll do the a lecture of vitreous and retina. We'll highlight this paper a little bit more, but there is an international vitreomacular traction study group. That's why you saw recently, like say as recent as 2013, but some of your retina guys have switched over to using things like vitreomacular traction, vitreomacular adhesion, and full thickness macular holes. And there's criteria out there. So with that one being said, and I see a polling question that I'll answer. It's which uh, eye here has a be better visual prognosis? Nothing fancy here. Top eye, bottom eye. Top or bottom? Which one has a better visual prognosis? Um, would you give her an Amsler grid in the meantime to be monitored? Sure. I don't see it's a it, it's a bad reason. You know, she's got a macular problem. Um, give her an Amsler grid. Tell her to look at it. You know, tell her to look at uh, the scores. If she likes ESPN, tell her to look at that. Something that's got some detail, cover her eye periodically, AMSR grid for sure. Um, and just looking for any type of change and she can come in before that. But I followed her probably every two or three months um, before she released because there's a lot of traction there. Would you, what uh, what expected age change? Top phobia is still attached. All right. So it's pretty much a split. And there's no exact, again, just want to try to get you some, some thought process here. I'll tell you what my thoughts are. I'll share the results. It's about 50-50. They say the top eye has better visual prognosis. Uh, I'll stop the results. Let me get polling question number eight here. And I'm going to say the top eye has better visual prognosis, right? These are both what we call focal vitreomacular traction. You can see the vitreous is pulling up here on the inner retina. Now, Joe pointed out earlier, this is, this is the separation. See that loose adhesion? This is the inner retina. This is the outer retina. Lots of pulling going on. But from the external limiting membrane, the myoid zone, which is the dark zone, then the ellipsoid zone, then you have uh, the RPE. This, this, the photoreceptor integrity line, the inner and outer segment, the ellipsoid zone is still intact. 
when you come down here, this is a little bit more still focal, but you could see here the the ellipsoid zone is a little bit more compromised. So I'm going to say that the visual prognosis of this patient, because the photoreceptors are being involved, I would pick that the better visual prognosis is in the upper. Now, things can change, but just by looking at these two, there's a lot of damage going on to the outer retina. And remember, that's the photoreceptors that's out there. All right. So, you know, what is this layer called? Just right here, I kind of went through it. This is the photoreceptor integrity line. Uh, this is the inner and outer segment. It's the ellipsoid zone. One of the things I've been liking to teach uh, with this is that why does that hyperfluoresce? And as Joe mentioned in my intro, I've been doing a lot of integrative medicine and talks, and I was really kind of you know, when we talk about nutrition and oxidative stress, it's all about the mitochondria. And I really geeked out when I said, that, you know, the ellipsoid zone, it hyperfluoresces because it's mainly composed of the mitochondria. So this is a good one to point it out. You can see the external limiting membrane. This is called the myoid zone as opposed to the ellipsoid zone. The dark area is the myoid zone. That's where the endoplasmic reticulum and the Golgi apparatus, that's where a lot of protein synthesis occurs. It gets the energy from the mitochondria. This mitochondria looks really healthy here. The mitochondria on this patient here doesn't look pretty healthy through here, but once you get to the fovea and the foveolar pit, there's a lot of damage and a lot of stress. So that vision is going to be pretty well compromised. Then on OCT Connect, then someone posted this, the interpretation of OCT and OCTA. And then I even geeked out even more because it talked about the mitochondria of the RPE. So there's a lot of mitochondria, especially down here. And there's more mitochondria in the RPE than in the photoreceptor. And that becomes important in that disease called macular degeneration. But we're going to be talking about a different, we could talk about that at a different time. We covered a little bit of that in a nutrition course uh, a few weeks back. But let's go to this patient here now. This is a 73-year-old man with uh, uh, in for a cataract surgery. Let's take a look. 104, 103, 105, 108, 106, and 107. That all looks pretty good. Now we jump to here and whoa, what's going on? You know, with 293, 292, one micron, jump to here, 330 to 256. All right, there's that 10 micron. Whoa, what's going on? Well, let's go up here and take a look. And maybe you can open up uh, different scans, but I think you can see it on here. Can you appreciate the epiretinal membrane? The epiretinal membrane on this patient is what's causing this asymmetry. The ganglion cell looks to be unaffected, but when you go by the full thickness map, you go going by that asymmetry, there's 334, there's 283. We're outside that 10 to 15 microns when you get over to the retina. That's going to cause me to open up, but you can kind of see it here in this horizontal cut through here and this vertical cut through here that you can see the epiretinal membrane. And that's what's causing that asymmetry. And there it is on what we call an onfos, onfos, en face, onfos. You click on this, there's different ways and different instruments. You can see the epiretinal membrane here. You can see the epiretinal membrane here, but you can see the epiretinal membrane right here and how it's contracting and pulling on itself and why it's giving this retina map right here, that, that number because of the contraction that it's having. That vitreous can create lots of issues, and it's going to be in another lecture that I do here in a couple of weeks on how it can change. I've had patients get treated because they had PVDs pulling on their, their ganglion cell, and then it released, and then they changed, and they thought they were having a GCC, but you can clearly see like the vitreous extraction traction has released, and that's what caused the change. So uh, we'll do that in a different lecture at a different time. So here's just another cut of this patient showing that epiretinal membrane throwing off and creating this yellow and red disease. And this is real disease going on right here. 
All right. Here's a patient, a 63-year-old woman uh, with diabetes, hemoglobin A1C. And as Joe was mentioning earlier, you know, we, this is typically where we look with patients with diabetes is right through here. And right through here, there's a little vitreomacular adhesion. There's really no distortion. That's why it's not traction. Little vitreomacular adhesion here. 93, 90, 96, 93, 96, 92, 3, 4, 2, lots going on here. Got this little red thing, got this little yellow thing, but we got some blues here. We got some greens here. And whenever I had this hidden, you know, everything looks pretty good. This patient's with diabetes. Is there any, maybe right here, see the hyperfluorescent, hyper, hyper, in this area right in here, a little bit of hyperfluorescence. Could that be exudate? Well, I think it could be because now if you go down and look at the foveal avascular zone, see the expansion? Look, I think a lot of us might say, ah, eh, don't worry about the diabetic retinopathy in this patient. Look here how this is expanding. Look at the foveal avascular zone. Look at the dropout. Look at the dropout right here. There's a dropout over here, but it's not as advanced. You can see in this area, there's a 37 uh, that's here, but you have to go inside 47, even though there's a 37 here, there's a uh, 41 here. The density is dropping. And when you go and you look right here a little closer, you see the dropout. And then when you look at the on FOSS, you can see the exudate. There's the exudate. That's not too bad. Remember, diabetes is a disease of the capillaries. And you can see the dropout here. So we're going to be doing diabetic exam and evaluations. The crime must fit the punishment. You hear us say it all the time. We probably should be evaluating patients with diabetes with looking at the capillaries and not just the B scans. I find where there's a lot of B scans in the practice that are normal, like right here, you might be scratching your head is that disease. But when you go and you look at the capillaries and now you can see the exudate, um, you can definitely say this patient has diabetic retinopathy. I've cleared it. I'm the third party chair for the third uh, for the Pennsylvania Optometric Association. I've met with all the big payers, the federal, commercial. It's all diabetic retinopathy. We're just using instrumentation to get that early diagnosis. Yes, it might not be, you know, dot and blot hemorrhages and and might well, there's microaneurysms. There's microaneurysms within here. Just that it's uh, not not your dot and blot hemorrhages, your exudate, your irmas, um, your you know your dot, your your hemorrhaging and your and your what I call now the macro changes. These are the micro changes that we pick up, and this is it, you know early detection of diabetic retinopathy. Fifty nine year old man with diabetes, right? But now if we get down here and use some of these rules, oh look how nice and tight this is. You got to look at everything, as Joe said. Now, if we remove this, now we can see the exudates. And there's a great example there, Joe, of your exudates that you were pointing out. Mm -hmm. Right here are the blood vessels, but here are the exudates and how they're in that between that inner and outer. The leakage is up here with the this is where the capillaries are. The leaky capillaries are up here. Remember the photoreceptors. They don't have blood in it. That's why they have to get it from the inner retina and the choriocapillaris and the, and the choroid. It's, it's, it's an avascular area that needs to get nutrition. And there's a loose area in here. So these, these leaky blood vessels are now kind of in this space that we showed that was separating uh, whenever we had that vitreomacular uh, traction or a little bit earlier when I was asking about which eye is better. Um, that's out there. All right, advanced interpretation uh, of green disease. Um, so look, this is what we said. Uh, we start here, 110, 104, uh, 109, 109, symmetry, 110, uh, 98. There's a 12 difference here in the GCC. Come down here, so everything looks normal. This looks normal. Okay, let's go eight microns, 10 microns, uh, what's that? Uh, 53, that's seven microns. We've got, oh, here's 20 microns. Here's this versus this. That was enough for me to say, all right, I need to kind of take a, a deeper dive. But if we take a look here, 
This one's kind of going to kind of blow my, uh, my, my theory up there that disease is not in both eyes and it's uh, you know, not symmetric. Well, luckily it's not symmetric in this one quadrant. This is a bilateral epiretinal membrane patient. And it's making these GCCs really thick, thicker than average. But you can see that it's kind of a 71-year-old woman going for cataract check. And it's good to know because, you know, they go for cataract surgery and you talk to them about scar tissue on their implant. And then they're like, oh, I didn't have scar tissue on my retina before that. And I'm like, well, you know, let's go back and take a look. Yeah, I guess you did. So I like always pointing out, pretty much I have a rule of thumb before sending anyone for cataract surgery, I get a raster or some type of scan of their macula because I want to know what it looked like before because it's hard to have those talks after for them to say, oh, no, I don't think I had scar tissue. The cataract surgery created it. But on this 71-year-old, when you go to the on -foss, you could see where it is right down here, the epiretinal membrane. You can remember that's the, this is the right eye. So down here, inferior, right? That 329, uh, inferior, this cut right here going down, this is the inferior side. You can see now why, because the disease is down in this area. And if I come over here, oh, that's still the right eye. Here's the left eye. You know, it's a little bit harder to see on the on -foss where the exact disease is, but you can see what I've cut through here. This cut and this cut is right here where I am on here. You can see the epiretinal membrane. You can see it right there. So you got to be careful. This is a great green disease, right? Oh, everything looks good. No, there's actually bilateral epiretinal membranes that are out there. All right. Let's see how we did. See how we're doing. Let's go back and let's see if I have the polling question now. All right. Is this one real disease or physiologically normal? Real disease or physiologically normal? As we go through, we see a lot of yellow and red. We've got green, red here, red, yellow, red, one micron, zero, three, six, pretty symmetric. You can see what's happening over here. Let's go up here and take a look. You know, Greg, a, a question just came through to me. I'm gonna I'm gonna share it. I think it's a very, very good question. Do you, do you still look at the macula and optic nerve lamp or do you depend mostly on OCT? The answer is you, you use everything. I, I obviously we'll look at with the macula, we'll look at the, you know, for glaucoma, I'm certainly gonna be looking at the optic nerve with a non-contact lens. I will look at the macula to see what's going on. Uh, OCT is very helpful. Uh, it was actually very helpful to me uh, last week. I had a situation where a patient was complaining about a floating spot and the, the floating spot, you know, we discussed the whole issue of, uh, of uh, PVD and floaters. And he said, uh, it doesn't seem to catch up. It seems to always be there. And I examined very, very critically. And I, I, I did not see anything in the vitreous. I did not see anything in the retina. So I did run an OCT. And even knowing what the OCT looked like clinically, I, I had difficulty. He had an area of, uh, of serous, ret uh, serous retinopathy. He had a split uh, extra 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 fogally, and that was a spot he saw moving. Yeah. So everything helps. Everything together helps. We still have to do it the old-fashioned way and actually examine the patient. But the OCT is is, is a, a valuable adjunct. Anything you want to add to that, Greg? Yeah, I mean, I mean, you know, obviously, Joe, you and I graduated before OCTs were out, neurofiber layer GDX. We actually had to examine and before we had all this and look at the retina and pick up epiretinal membranes. But even with that said, examining the eye absolutely can solve a lot of 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 issues. And like you said, uh, maybe, you know, maybe you didn't say it, but you can also find other things in there that's going on with the patient that won't be picked up on an OCT. So you got to use everything. I certainly will echo what you said. All right, let me share the results. 
And this was the same exact polling question that I had. Uh, let's see, this poll eight is, uh, is, was number three. And let's see here, how did we do? We went from 87 to 47, and we went from physiologically normal to 53. So we shifted. To me, this is a, a, a normal. So we went up on that one. So that was really, really cool. All right, here's number nine. Let's see here, let's scroll up and let's launch it right here. Is this real disease or physiologically normal? This wasn't one of the first three, but maybe we saw it along the way. Hey, Greg, for, forgive me if I missed it. Do we answer, answer the question about what point of visual macular traction should a hole we prefer? Um, we didn't answer it, but if you want to take a whack at it, and then I'll take a whack at it. And... Yeah. I am referring fewer of them, to be honest with you. Uh, I, I usually watch them. As Greg gave, you know, gave two, uh, two nice examples, one had a, a focal adhesion, which is more at risk of, uh, of, of progressing on with a bad outcome. The other, the other one had uh, a better prognosis. It, a lot of it depends on what the patient's acuity is, because the treatment has to uh, be less, sev less severe than the disease. If a person has a 2025 or 2030 acuity, uh, typically, I'm not going to refer them whenever I have the uh, the retinal specialist will just watch or, or send the patient back. So a lot of it is symptomatology. A lot of it is, does it change negatively over time? And uh, what is their overall visual acuity? Yeah, I mean, and just going to vitreo macular traction, I look for a, 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 a macular hole forming, whether it's stage one through four or full thickness now uh, or not full thickness. Once that starts happening, it's a referral. Mm -hmm. um, I pretty much watch them. Um, lamellar holes, I watch. Um, but anytime I start seeing a macular hole, full thickness macular hole kind of developing, that's whenever I refer them. Because I can watch them just like you said, Joe. I can watch them just mm -hmm. as good as the retinologist. Jet tria, they're not going to use. Um, at least my retinologists don't do it. There's too many other complications. Um, like you said, if the acuity is good, they're not going to do a, a membrane peel because there's more problems that happen when you remove the vitreous and and do a membrane peel. But if their acuity is is starting to go, if they're forming a full thickness macular hole, then it's time to to refer. So, all right. I'm not sure if I shared the results, but I'll share them real quick again. Uh, number nine, I agree. There's real disease here. Um, you really don't have the history, but it's a glaucoma patient. We saw this. This is the one Joe was talking about with the with the averages here and and this really bad disease, but it's yellow and it's saying good here, but there's a, or I mean, a red here and a yellow here. This is glaucoma, just asymmetry. So again, it's a little bit unfair. I'm not giving any histories. But uh, how about this one here? Let's stop sharing. Let me get polling question number 10 up. And let's and for see. those who have, have made comments about not being able to see the image, you can you can left click on the poll and just drag it out of out of your uh, out of your field so you can see the image. Is this I've one? Had... Oh, sorry, Joe, go ahead. I've I've had several people. Uh, direct message me or public message. Just uh, just uh, left click and dra drag the poll out of your way. All right. I think Real that catches catches us up on on questions. Perfect. Real disease or physiologically normal? All right, let's end that one. We got a pretty good amount. Share the results. All right, this was the first polling question we did. We had 30% say that it was real disease. 
and we dropped that down to 16 and 70 went up to 84. And I agree with the majority here. If I was phoning a friend that this is just physiologically normal, we just have an abnormal amount, robust GCC. I don't see an epiretinal membrane, uh, any disease process going on. Everything looks good. Everything is just very symmetric. I'm not really seeing any, any disease process going on here. All right. Stop sharing. Let's do number 11. Let's see here. Watch. And like Joe mentioned, if it's in your way, drag it out of the way right now. Right, Joe? Is that what they do? We have this here. Yellow and red. This is green, this all looks good. Resort to the B scans, real disease or physiologically normal. Okay. Nice little trend coming in here. I'm going to end it, share the results. And I would go with real disease, right? We have a little bit of red and yellow being flagged from the normative database. And you can see there's a little bit of an epiretinal membrane going on. All right, I think I got one more here. Stop sharing. And let's do number 12. And we're getting close to being to our witching hour. So I'm going to just do this. Either of you using an ERG instrument to look at ganglion cells or, or just uh, OCT? Yeah, no, it's a great question. Um, I just started looking at the instrument, working with the company, talking to them. Um, it's a pretty cool instrument that's out there. ERG has certainly got a lot easier to do in the office. Um, for It's really good to me for glaucoma. Um, you could, you know, get that early detection if they have a high pressure, lower it. That's early detection. Um, and some of the other conditions that it can do, you need to be really comfortable with your integrative side because um, I've been talking about it a lot. Dark adaptation, ERG, VEP, the Rabin cone contrast sensitivity. You're getting yourself to such an early detection that there's really not a good um, allopathic, you know, pill for that ill type of treatment. Um, you better be feel comfortable and maybe talking about some nutritional stuff, but you just said glaucoma, you can still lower the IOP. So it sounds like it's a, a nice way to go. So I'm going to end the poll, going to share the results. This is going to be a fun one right here because this was poll number two. This was 50-50 where it said real disease. And we shifted from real disease down to physiologically normal from 49% said physiologically normal to now 86%, which is really, really, really cool uh, that's out there. And you're welcome, Nora. Thank you. Thanks for attending. Thanks for the question. Um, so these are the hints. Um, I'm not going to go through this case, but I want to show something in this case, Joe, and I'm going to wrap it up because we're going to want to make sure I respect everyone's time. Um, we have seen this case before, but you know the key here. Um, I prefer looking at bilateral scans. Remember, disease is usually bilateral but asymmetric. If it's not symmetric, start thinking that it's not physiologically normal. It's uh, probably an anatomic variation uh, for a normal patient. We talked about the GCC. I had two cases I was going to do in case we needed them, but I'm just going to show you this case here. I just want to show one specific point here. Here's a 51-year-old man that I've been following for ocular hypertension for many years. His recent pressures are getting into the 30s, and I'm not treating him. He's a physical therapist. He understands risk, treatment, da 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 da, da. So we're just doing close observation on him. His visual field is clean. 
But this is, well, let's do this, do this last question right here. And this is where I'll end. I'm going to do this right here. Is this, here's my person. Look, I'm going to go back. I'm going to come back to this. Here he is right here. Ocular hypertension, 3032. He's had high pressures. Here's his nerve fiber layer in GCC. Is it glaucomatous, do you think? Or is it uh, real disease? Greg, there's a quick question that came up. What, what number of the GLV difference raises a red flag <laughs> for you? Um, the late Larry Alexander is the one that taught me all about FLV and GLV. And I wanted to dive into the numbers and he, he, he explained it to me because he was the one that helped with OptiView come up with it. Um, and he sat with me for an hour and a half, explained it to me. And it really, because it's percentages, you got to be careful. It really just go by the, the color. It uh, really comes down that the color is super important in this one because of the percentage. This is saying that it's a global loss volume. It's not really focal. So let's just talk about this because a lot of the people have rolled in. And I agree, physiologically normal. I mean, this guy is walking around with a pressure of 30. You might start this patient on glaucoma meds, but look how symmetric. Zero, one, and two. It's saying it's not glaucoma. It's just a general loss. He's a higher myope. Look at the T-snip between the two eyes. Now, I'm going to respect the time here. I'm not going to go through the whole case, but I'm just going to kind of show you over time, his pressures have gone up. Look, they're in the 30s. I use the aura. Update 2021. Here's his nerves. And then look what has happened to his GCC over time. Oops, sorry, GCC. Nothing. Look. Disease, disease, disease. It's not disease. It's just outside the normative database. Nerve fiber layer straight across. GCC. The guy's walking around the pressure of 35. This is showing down, but it's the nerve fiber layer. This is showing up. And well, then we can the use... Central Greg, what is the central coronal thickness? That was a question that just came in. Uh, do I have it on here? Uh, is it on here? Da, 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 da. 589. Where is it? Where is it? Right here. 589. 589. Thank you. And um, so 589, maybe a little decrease. Um, I don't get too concerned unless it's 500 or 600. Um, let's see here. Look at this straight across uh, on the right eye, little downhill on the left eye, uphill here. All this stuff using angiography kind of mixed and stable that's out there. So he's and then the next case was just glaucoma, using a glaucoma to show you that the GCC right here, again, this is a glaucoma case. See, good, asymmetric in that prone zone. Look at the disease here in the nerve fiber layer, a lot worse over here. You can see the asymmetry. This is a known glaucoma patient. All right, I'm going to respect the time. I'm going to stop here. I'm going to stop sharing. I'm going to... Oops, get the poll now out of the way. I just had the same issue that our, our, our docs have. And get to right there. So I'm going to end it there and say thanks, everyone, for attending uh, uh, OCT interpretation, red, yellow, blue, what's normal, what's real, what's physiologically normal. This was an uh, interactive distance learning course, synchronous virtual um, thanks everyone. Is there any other questions, Joe, before we wrap it up? No, just, uh, thank you and comments on a great lecture, which I will, uh, I certainly agree with.